So if I think back to growing up in Kampala, which is the capital of Uganda, at that point, the country's population was about 14 million. Today, the country's population is close to 40 million. And that's just, a, you know, that example is, is replicated all across Africa. For that emerging consumer, you can start to see how real, very basic opportunities, you know, fast food, organized grocery stores. Now, I think what has accelerated those things and others is the rapid pace of digitization, right? So when you pull all that together, you've got this demand formation that then feeds into what we see as potentially attractive um, opportunities. I generally think that the magnitude of risk in Africa uh, is, is thought to be larger than it actually is. Uh, over the last decade, Africa has continued to stabilize relative to its history. And if you zoom out and look at the rest of the world, I think that by and large, geopolitical risk in the world is going up. So I think that's an important thing to consider, especially when global investors are trying to build a diversified portfolio, because I do think a lot of those geopolitical risks are idiosyncratic. I'm Jim Haskell, editor of the Bridgewater Daily Observations. You know, I don't think I'm going out on a limb when I say that the single most important goal for investors constructing portfolios is to find investments or what we call return streams that will generate decent returns with acceptable risk and that will also provide diversification benefits to the overall portfolio. And while this goal is timeless, finding good and especially diversifying return streams is even more essential in an environment like the current one where we have high inflation and central bank tightening, and all of this is weighing on financial assets and causing correlations between assets to increase. So with that in mind, we thought it'd be useful to think a little bit outside the box and examine return streams that most investors don't have in their portfolio. And to that end, we're hosting a discussion today with two Bridgewater veterans, Richard O'Kello, who is the co-founder of Sango Capital, and Peter Orth, the co-founder of 4DX Ventures, to talk about their experience investing in Africa and why the region can be a beneficial addition to portfolios, especially when most investors have little to no Africa exposure. This is such a big subject, and we obviously could talk for hours. So we're going to focus on four main topics, why Richard and Peter see Africa as an attractive market for investors, the type of financial markets that are investable in Africa, the risks investors face, and why exposure to Africa's economy can be diversifying. So Richard, Peter, welcome to the podcast. I, I want to start with a question of what drew both of you to Africa. And Richard, let me start with you. Why did you decide to focus on Africa as opposed to other emerging markets or other markets more generally? What, what makes Africa unique to you? So that's a great question, Jim. We, the question, obviously, we get to almost on a daily basis at this point. So I grew up in East Africa, in Uganda, and Africa was always interesting to me as, a, as sort of a native of, our, of, of the continent. However, most of my investment training prior to coming back to do this was in the U.S. And so within, as I thought about Africa from the U.S., I think the things that stood out for me were the following. I think one, in general, I mean, what makes anything interesting for long-term return generation you know, do you have great risk premiums that are mispriced? And do you have opportunities to create alpha? Do you have information or other asymmetry to create alpha? And I think as I looked at Africa, I saw a continent that had brought together a collection of factors that made it particularly interesting at this point in time. One, its growth had gone from being cyclical to being secular, to being driven by factors that are sustained. And that growth was manifesting in sectors and in companies. And so there's an opportunity there to get good risk premiums that way. Um, that growth was mostly domestic in nature, unlike other parts of the world. And so that generally meant that you could access that growth in ways that were lowly correlated, because it was mostly domestic and different across countries. Africa's size and complexity, you know, combined with its sort of varied cultural history, then also meant that the highest quality information flow, which you need to obviously generate returns, uh, tended to be closely held. You don't have a lot of intermediation in Africa. And so that information asymmetry lent itself to good opportunities for alpha generation. Um, and I think the last point was that Africa was seemed to be one of the only places left where you could generate good financial returns, potentially generate good financial returns, and also do a lot of good where you didn't have to trade off one versus the other. Uh, and obviously that's become much more important as, as, as we've gone along. Now, you also asked the question about whether or not 
any of these things are unique. I think, I think the fact that Africa is outgrowing every other region in the world does not actually make it unique. I think what makes it unique or makes its growth unique is that Africa's growth drivers are more sustained than other regions globally, you know, because they're secular in nature. So if you think about things like urbanization, you've been to virtually any African, major African city, the rate of urbanization is very rapid. It's unstoppable at this point, and it has a cascade effect on demand and supply for virtually everything. Uh, and this will go on, I think, for the next two or three or four decades. You know, what's going on with demographics, same thing. And so the fact that that was secular in nature, I think, makes Africa unique. And Peter, same question to you now. What drew you to Africa and what makes it a unique opportunity for investors in your view? Sure. First off, I agree with basically everything Richard said there. And I have a different story of how I came to to focus my career in Africa, starting on the, the emerging markets team at Bridgewater and spending a lot of time focusing on China, uh, developed a strong appreciation for how powerful it can be to invest in a country that has a very strong secular growth story and the beta returns that that can result in. When I decided to start investing in Africa, it was a combination of that top-down approach and thinking that the secular drivers of returns in Africa uh, look to be incredibly strong. There's the significant demographic tailwinds that Africa is seeing. Africa has uh, the youngest population in the world, uh, 20 years median age right now, which is resulting in the fastest workforce growth in the world when combined with also the fastest growing population. There is a large degree of development catch up that I think Africa is going to face. And also, you know, particularly with the the opportunity set that we're looking at in the the technology space, a really fast paced of digitization. And, you know, when you look at that uh, combined with the on the ground experience that we got from my my co-founder, who's uh, born and raised in Ghana, it, it looked like a very attractive opportunity, not just from a beta perspective, but also from an alpha perspective, because generally speaking, global investors aren't really investing in Africa. There's a large perception gap where the view of Africa is generally uh, a little dated and pretty negative and isn't taking into account the significant improvements that are happening around uh, the ease of doing business, relative stability, and also the rate of digitization that's driving a, a huge opportunity for technology businesses specifically to take market share from older companies and drive productivity growth, as well as to drive a you know, a very strong positive impact on society, with uh, which uh, Richard also mentioned. And when we talk about Africa, obviously it's a huge place made up of dozens of countries. Is the right way to think of Africa at the continent level or at the country level? Uh, the way that you know we think about it is there's specific countries that are, are probably the best investment destinations right now because they are the most developed, the easiest to do business in, and the largest economies. And generally speaking, uh, you know, those countries are Nigeria, Kenya, Egypt, and South Africa, though there's a handful of other countries that we're focused on as well and we think are, are very attractive. And generally speaking, when we're investing in operating countries that are headquartered in those countries, they tend to expand outside of that area to capture you know, a more uh, you know, entire picture of the African continent. So we don't need to invest in every country to get exposure to the continent because our companies are doing that for us. So now you both mentioned particular aspects of Africa that make it an attractive investment destination, things like digitization, urbanization, and also demographics. Tell us more, if you would, about how that's evolved and maybe give us some specific examples. So if I think back to growing up in Kampala, which is the capital of Uganda, the city had at most maybe 750,000 people in terms of its population, right? It's the capital city of the country. At that point, the country's population was about 14 million. Today, the country's population is close to 40 million, four zero, and the city has 5 million people. Now, that's all happened in the last, gosh, 20, 25 years, maybe. And that's just, a, you know, that example is, is replicated all across Africa. So if you take that example and you think about what happens when a city grows at that rate in that type of time frame, lots of 
new family formation, lots of people are moving to the cities. They got to eat, they got to move around. Their kids need to go to school, they need healthcare. The creation of demand is generally unparalleled and supply into that demand typically lags that demand, right? And so when you think about themes like urbanization, I mean, think about lots of consumers being created at a rapid clip with wallet share. You know, they're working or they're doing, you know, they might be working in an office or they might be working in sort of the informal sector. They've got, you know, a cell phone business, a fast food business, whatever it is, they're making money. They, they want to spend that money. They, they have less time and so on. And that's, that's sort of the urbanization story, just to use an example. So that dynamic um, is getting replicated across much of Africa. And if you then, as an investor, you look at that and you say, okay, well, where are the opportunities that are interesting or the potential opportunities that are interesting? And simply by focusing on that consumer or that emerging consumer, you can start to see how real, very basic opportunities, you know, fast food, for example, or grocery stores, right? Organized grocery stores. People want to be able to go into a store and buy food and not have to go to a market and line up and kind of, you know, haggle for food and things like that, right? So, so that's one example that's sort of where urbanization sits. But if you also think about infrastructure need, right? So lots of cities getting created, you need lots of power. The supply of energy into those cities generally lags the creation of those cities. So whereas electricity as a sector, for, for instance, should be generally a boring old sector, and it is in most parts of the world, in Africa, electricity ends up being a, a very interesting private equity investment because the types of return premiums that exist there are super normal until enough energy has been provided into those cities, right? Now, I think what has accelerated those themes and others is what Peter alluded to, which is digitization, the rapid pace of digitization, right? So again, if you think about, if I use my own experience, you know, growing up, there were no cell phones. I mean, there was, if you're fortunate, maybe you had a landline in the house, maybe, right? Today, everyone's got one or two cell phones and most of their life operates around the cell phone. What that then means is that a number of things that have occurred in other geographies that have taken time just get accelerated in Africa because a lot of that um, gets leapfrogged, right? And so if people uh, in, let's say, Latin America went through a process of getting bank accounts, a lot of what happens in Africa is people just essentially just skip that step. They get their bank account on their phone, in their hand. The way they transact, the way they think about information access and so on changes, right? So when you pull all that together, I think what the average listener will see is they'll see GDP growth that's strong. But what's really happening on the ground is you've got this demand formation that then feeds into what we see as potentially attractive um, opportunities. I, I agree with everything that Richard said. And to just build on some of the points, you know, one forecast from the you know, U.S. Department of National Intelligence has 50 percent of uh, the urbanization growth through 2040 from low-income countries coming from Africa. I mean, this is a massive, massive um, urbanization boom here. One other stat that I can point to is early on, you know, in our fund journey, say in 2017, there was $500 million of venture capital deployed in Africa a year. Um, in 2021, that number jumped to 5 billion, you know, a 10x in just four years. And so, you know, very clearly, the perceptions are starting to turn and global investors are starting to recognize that this is a really big opportunity. You know, however, that level of investment is still well behind other emerging markets uh, across the world uh, by a handful of different measures, if you measure it relative to the size of the economy, or you know, I, I certainly think relative to the size of the opportunity. And so I, I think you're going to see continued growth in the investment flows that are supporting you know, the types of businesses that, that Richard was talking about you know, in terms of digital first businesses that are helping either organize informal commerce and bring it digital and aggregate it and make it more organized, uh, or in terms of providing basic banking and lending services to consumers. And I, I think that there's you know, large existing um, you know, consumption and demand verticals that we're seeing technology businesses come in, uh, provide a, a way more efficient uh, and effective business model than existing options, and very rapidly take market share. And we're just at the very, very beginning of that starting to occur. 
And I think that there's a lot of room for businesses who are taking advantage of these trends to have significant growth in the coming decades. All right. I want to turn from the opportunities you're seeing in Africa to actual implementation, because a lot of our listeners may not necessarily be familiar with the size and shape of Africa's capital markets. How should investors think about getting exposure to Africa? Let's start with the public asset classes for a second, because people typically, I think, or investors typically start want to start with public asset classes when they get, get into a new geography. So public equities, I'd say African public equities sit at somewhere in the order of about $1.6 or $1.8 trillion in terms of market cap. However, much of this is South Africa. I'd say like maybe 1.3 of that is South Africa. And and this you know this dropped drops off precipitously once you, once you start to look at other markets whether it's Egypt or Kenya or whatnot those markets are much much smaller. The challenge is that the South African public market generally does not give you good exposure to the rest of Africa. If you were to look at let's say the top ten or t- top twenty stocks in, in South Africa, and you look at their Africa excluding South Africa exposure, that would be somewhere in the order of, you know, one to 2% or one to 3% depending, depending on the company, right? And so, so the public markets, although the market cap is reasonable, I mean, it's not, it's not humongous because this is still a maybe 2% of the global market cap, for, for instance, but it's large enough for someone to execute. It's challenging if, if you want to get exposure to growth in the rest of Africa to do that through South Africa. Um, if you are to do that through the other markets, I think you would have to think of public equities as shorter term or short to medium term exposure in terms of liquidity, right? So getting in and out of positions takes longer because they're obviously smaller markets, they're less liquid. Institutions still do that, but you, you have to sort of think about liquidity, uh, illiquidity premiums there. On the private side, I'd say that the large markets on the private side are primarily private equity. If you think about both funds and non-funds, I'd say you'd be thinking about 100 to $150 billion of exposure. And so that's meaningful enough, I think, for institutions that have exposure to alternative asset classes to get exposure to private equity. Venture, as uh, Peter spoke about, is a newer asset class, uh, but it's growing very, very rapidly. And I think becoming increasingly interesting and executable for you know, even mid-sized institutions. Peter, let me bring you in here. I take it, given Richard's comments, probably the private markets are a better way to access the opportunities in Africa. Is that something you agree with? I think they're the only way to access the the opportunities in Africa, the biggest opportunities that we see in Africa, uh, which is the growth of the digital economy and digitization across the continent. You know, I agree with Richard's point that in public equity markets, you're, you're getting a really unbalanced country exposure but what I would also say is you're, you're getting a very unbalanced sector exposure as well, where the public equities by and large are, are giving you exposure to very traditional sectors. And there's only, you know, uh, like under five public companies that really, I would say, are in the technology space. And they're a very tiny part of the overall market capitalization. And so if you want to get exposure to that digital growth story, really the only way to do that is through private markets and specifically venture capital. Just to sum up on the return side, you know, if if one was to look at a private equity portfolio, like what kinds of returns, what are the kind of range of returns, or maybe you could put it in terms of relative to the developed world, should one be looking for in a in a portfolio of private equity assets in Africa or venture capital assets in Africa? So the way we we think about it is the only reason to be in Africa as an investor is you can get better performance than you could in your backyard, right? And so if the audience was a US audience, just to simplify this discussion, and they could get access to sort of top quartile private equity performance historically, which that data is available, they basically get access to somewhere in the region of, I don't know, 1.7 times money invested to maybe 2.2 times money invested, 2.5 times money, somewhere in that range, right? If they could get access to top quartile fund managers, which you can't always do that, but let's assume they can. So I think within that context, the way to think about Africa would be that an investor in Africa ought to get either that type of return with lower risk of capital loss or a better return with the same risk of capital loss, 
for that to make sense. And so what does that mean? That might mean that the investor coming into Africa expects to get an extra 0.5 to 1x above that in terms of multiple. And in terms of IRRs, if developed market IRRs are more like 15% IRRs, you know, then African IRRs are more like 20 to 25% IRRs uh, in, in, in order for that risk reward trade-off to make sense. I think the key there though, Jim, is that a lot of investors coming into Africa have got a perspective on risk of capital loss that is just inconsistent with reality, we found. And so it's important for investors to be accurately calibrating that perspective to say, okay, well, what's my real risk of losing money here? And is it higher or lower than what I thought or what I know, or what I've seen in other emerging markets? And therefore, what do I need to be rewarded with in order for that to make sense? I want to turn to the risk side of things that you mentioned uh, in a second. But before I do, Peter, is there anything you'd add to what Richard said in terms of venture capital? Yeah, we both talked about the, the fact that we think there's a larger risk premium in Africa relative to other regions in the world currently. And on the venture side specifically, you know, I would say that the, the growth of the venture capital landscape is another secular catch-up story in addition to the, the other secular stories that we've discussed, where if you look at other emerging markets around the world, maybe I can mention China and India as two, if you look at how venture capital started and then grew and then matured, if, if you participated in the early part of that cycle, uh, moving from the early days into the formalization stage, into the stage where you're starting to experience exits, you know, I believe that the, the, the returns for those early venture capital investors uh, were quite attractive and would represent top quartile or top decile uh, venture capital returns. And you know, I think part of that is just in the early stages, there's a really significant alpha opportunity where it's still a, a little bit unclear. There, there's just large information asymmetries. And if you can develop an expertise and an insight early on, you get rewarded for that. And also, I think that you know, generally speaking, the large venture capital inflows typically occur after you've started to experience uh, significant exits from companies in that ecosystem. And we're in the phase of Africa where we're just starting to get the first handful of exits in recent years. You know, and so I would expect that you know, over the next five to 10 years, risk premiums would contract and would be driving uh, you know, outsized returns uh, you know, for investors who have built positions prior to that. Great. Let's turn now to the uh, risk side. When investors think about emerging markets, and I remember my own investing in emerging markets many years ago, the common risks that they tend to focus on are political or, or geopolitical risks, and that would be property rights and the stability of governments. And, th and then, of course, the FX risks and the potential for devaluations and so on. So how do you think about those risks? And are they, by and large, idiosyncratic or common risks across the continent? Peter, why don't we start with you this time? Sure. On the risk side, again, I, I generally think that the magnitude of risk in Africa uh, is, is thought to be larger than it actually is. I think that uh, over the last decade, Africa has continued to stabilize relative to its history. And I think that geopolitical risk in general is, is flat to going down. And if you zoom out and look at the rest of the world, I think that by and large, geopolitical risk in the world is going up. And so the absolute magnitude of risk in Africa, I think, is lower than it has been. And I think that if you look at a pie chart of geopolitical risk in the world, Africa's slice of that has gone down materially, you know, given recent events in the developed world in, in, in the last handful of years. And so I think that's an important thing to consider, especially when global investors are trying to build a diversified portfolio, because I do think a lot of those geopolitical risks are idiosyncratic. Um, and so, you know, that's important to think about when building uh, an Africa-focused portfolio, diversifying across countries, as well as a global portfolio. And then on the FX risk side, I think that, you know, FX risk has uh, a portion of idiosyncratic risk, as well as a portion of risk that um, you know, could be attributable broadly to emerging market countries as, as well as, you know, maybe to the Africa region specifically. There is 
uh, some kind of a small risk premium on emerging market currencies. And so if you're building a diversified basket uh, of emerging market currencies, there might be some compensation for that over time. Not huge, of course. But then if you think about the magnitude of that FX risk relative to the returns of the asset classes we're talking about, specifically private equity and venture capital returns, you know, it's it's one thing if you're investing in government or corporate bonds where that FX risk is going to be, you know, very large in magnitude relative to the total returns. But given the, you know, degree of uh, overall risk and the size of the beta and alpha returns that we're talking about, I think as the you know overall pie chart of uh, you know drivers of returns, I actually think that FX risk is a lot smaller when you're talking about private equity, you know, especially over the you know the time frames uh, that you're holding the assets. And then there's a couple of other important things in terms of you know how we would think about mitigating that risk that still does exist. On one side, there's diversifying across countries, which is very important. Uh, I also think it's important to you know focus on the business models that you're you're backing. And you know certain sets of companies have higher exposure uh, to currency risk than others. And you know we find companies more attractive uh, when they're a little bit more insulated from that currency risk, you know than say, a company that is importing goods from other countries and then selling locally. Uh, you know that that would be much riskier than a you know a company that is, um, exporting, you know, digital labor globally or something like that and getting, you know, whose costs are denominated in local currencies and income is denominated in global currencies. So I, I think there's a lot of ways to mitigate that currency risk as, as well as the geopolitical risk through both diversification as well as the companies you focus on. And I think the magnitude of the risk overall relative to the size of returns we're talking about in these asset classes are a lot lower, you know, than say, Uh, traditional debt markets, or even public equity markets. Richard, how do you think about the risk side and specifically, you know, the FX risk as well as political risk and any other types of risks that you'd want to highlight? And on this question of idiosyncratic to particular countries versus is there risk that we should think about for the continent in general? So maybe you could just riff on about what you're seeing along these lines. I'll actually jump in right on the back of what Peter just said, which is, I'll start with political risk. I think I think the real challenge for Africa is that Africa generally doesn't control its narrative. It doesn't really tell its own story for the most part, right? It's, it's sort of told for it by others. And so part of that challenge then means that what's told is, is information that sells, which generally for Africa, as far as political risk goes, has tended to be backward looking. So to the point that Peter made, if I think about the Africa I grew up in, where political risk was very real and very present, and you were worried about governments changing militarily without, you know, in in ways that were unpredictable, sometimes violent, changes that might affect policies and, you know, the fact that property rights might get affected. Very hard to invest in that environment. If you fast forward to where we are today, Bloomberg today on its front page has this article on Angola. Angola has an election. And it's very interesting because the, the title, the caption is uh, Tough Fight Brews in Angola as Opposition Leader Charms Voters, right? This type of title would not exist, I'd say, 25 years ago, right? A conversation on Angola would be, you know, it's military, what's going on, can you even, even invest there? This is now a democratic election that's very closely, you know, be a very tight, tight race, right? So, so I think what we would encourage your listeners to think about is the gap between reality today and what the reality looks like that perhaps hasn't been as well reported on as it should have. Now, having said that, I think when we think about political risk, we worry a lot less about macro political risk. Where we see real political risks are areas like, let's say, micro political risk. The risk that you're operating in a sector where political interference can affect your ability to compete. If you think about, for instance, Egypt, yeah, for those that know Egypt well enough, the construction sector is mostly covered by farms that are essentially part of the military industrial complex in Egypt. And so if you want to go set up a business in the, in the construction sector in Egypt, well, good luck, to, good luck to you on that, right? I think another political risk that we worry about are risks that uh, start out um, as social tensions within countries and can spill over into sort of leadership or policy-driven risks and can affect sectors and industries and, and companies. 
But I, I'd say aside from those two, I tend to agree with Peter, which is that most people focus on headline political risk because that's what's reported. And that, in our view, tends to be quite mispriced. That's great. And, and one of the things you mentioned was diversification as a way to mitigate risk. So I want to turn to that subject now and ask you both about how investors should think about the diversification potential for African investment. What kind of diversification benefit can these return streams provide to a global portfolio and particularly a portfolio with most of its risk in the developed world? So I think if I look at where we are today and and perhaps talk a little bit more about where could this go, right? So where we are today, if we assume that a decent time frame for a private equity investor is, let's say, about five years. And if you were to look at just simple analytics, like, let's say, rolling five-year correlations of different African countries to each other or Africa to developed markets, for, for example, uh, that correlation today, Africa to developed markets would sit at about a 0.3 to 0.4, times just numerically, right? A little bit higher versus other emerging markets, about a 0.5, and there are good reasons for that, but not very high. Now, I think the key, though, from a portfolio construction standpoint, if you're going to be deploying capital into private assets, if you're going to think about, well, how might that develop going forward? And what are the transmission mechanisms that either accelerate that correlation upwards or, or basically diminish the correlation, right? So when I think about that, I think the key transmission mechanisms that typically do this around the world that don't apply as much in Africa, one, monetary policy. So if I think about globally what's, what's going on today with the world sort of gyrating back and forth in terms of market performance as a function of what central banks are doing, the Fed or the ECB, very high correlation driver there. That is not the case in Africa. Monetary policies in Africa are just not synchronized at all because central banks are independent and they're dealing with domestic issues in countries that are growing in very different ways and are driven by very different things. So that's, I think, one transmission mechanism that does not exist or doesn't work as as well in Africa, which has that effect of lowering correlation. And that I do not expect to change for a while, right? just given where the countries are. I think the second would be, if I think about the secular drivers of growth, in Africa that we've spoken about throughout the podcast and how those drivers are evolving relative to other geographies. So if I think about demographics, right, Africa's demographics, the aging of the population and so on and so forth, if I think about how that flows through to growth and to various other factors in Africa relative to Asia, relative to Latin America, where it's the opposite, where you have worsening demographics, uh, aging populations and so on, you have certain structured drivers there that I think will tend to make keep correlations low or potentially diminish them for certain countries in Africa relative to the world. I think a third mechanism would be trade. So trade is a very standard global transmission mechanism. You know, if I think about Asia, for example, anytime trade, global trade hits a wall, Asia has a problem. Africa's intra-regional trade is still very, very low, sitting at somewhere in the order of 15 to 20%. I think that will change. Over time, you you know, Africa has just established, I think, what is now the largest free trade area in the world. And so as that gathers steam, you would expect that intra-regional trade would pick up. So relationships between and across African countries will pick up as well as Africa to the rest of the world. And so that will become over time a transmission mechanism that probably increases correlations on the margin. Um, and then I'd say the, the other two things that tend to be cyclical drivers of correlation as opposed to secular drivers are commodity prices and the dollar, right? And so commodity prices, I think, uh, when you get a global commodity cycle, that, that's a dominant cycle, of dominant driver of returns, then that's going to affect certain African countries positively and others negatively. Now, if you are investing across Africa or investing in a range of economies that are diversified, that effect for you will tend to be muted, right? So for example, oil prices go up, Nigeria benefits, Angola benefits, Kenya struggles, Tanzania struggles. And so so depending on what your portfolio looks like, you're going to start to get some offsets from a global commodity dynamic. And then I'd say the same thing with the dollar, right? And so pulling all of that together, I think the key point is that a lot of investors are starting from hardly any or no exposure in Africa. And so On the margin, adding an uncorrelated asset like Africa that has, we believe, secular reasons to remain uncorrelated should be attractive for a global portfolio from a portfolio construction standpoint. Last question for you both. Is there a specific example of a sector or a business that highlights the dynamics you've discussed in terms of the opportunities or the diversification you can find in Africa? 
Sure. Uh, happy to go into that. First, I'll start general and then you know I'll go a little bit more specific. But the general type of companies that we think are very attractive to invest in are, are first, companies that are driving uh, the digitization of the economy. So companies that are operating more on the digital infrastructure level. So some examples of that are payments technology, tech-enabled logistics, connectivity, et cetera, which once they grow and scale, uh, enable a whole host of other, other companies to exist on the back of the digital infrastructure that they're creating. And I would say that those are the types of companies that have been most successful over the last five years. And now uh, their existence is, is opening up a whole set of other uh, types of business models that we, we think are very attractive. Some you know, examples that I would, I would list on the venture side are social commerce, creator economy companies, uh, you know, host of other fintech applications, you know, chiefly some that make saving and investing a lot easier and are leapfrogging, uh, you know, traditional uh, banking options. And then one other uh, type of company that I would talk about are companies that are existing in large existing consumption verticals that are aggregating fragmented demand and are creating dominant platforms. So one such business model is a company that is existing in the fast-moving consumer goods space, and currently something in the range of 80 to 90% of consumer goods are purchased through these really small mom-and-pop shops that are ubiquitous uh, you know, across all cities in Africa. And historically, those small, like really micro-businesses are family-run, and they're purchasing their goods from a variety of different wholesalers that they are physically going to and picking up those goods. Uh, those wholesalers are ordering from sub-distributors that are ordering from distributors that are ordering from manufacturers. It's a very opaque supply chain that's prone to stockouts, uh, doesn't have uh, price transparency, and it's, it's very time-consuming and inefficient uh, for those small businesses, you know, which at the same time, you know, are very vital to the social fabric of the society. Um, so an example business model is, is stepping into that supply chain, is ordering goods directly from manufacturers and enabling those small stores to make orders through an app, through WhatsApp, through other digital means, uh, and then are delivering those goods to the stores uh, are also supplying working capital financing uh, and other financial and digital services. And so they're cutting out a couple of layers of the supply chain, which at the end of the day enables cheaper prices for the stores and cheaper prices to consumers. And they're avoiding uh, you know, stockouts due to the degree of you know, su uh, supply trans transparency that they're creating. And because they're they're sitting in the middle here and aggregating a huge degree of demand, there's significant scale and network effects that enables them to be a dominant platform. And Richard, when you think about your uh, investing, is there a really a, a leap out example to you as well in terms of a sector, a company, or both that embodies the comments you've made on return risk and diversification? Perhaps what would be interesting, since Peter talked a little bit about venture, is for me to talk about exa an example on the private equity side. Another theme is... Uh, when we think about urbanization, one of the key opportunities to generate return by investing in that theme is in the food value chain. So what happens to food after it's been grown? Packaging, processing, cold chain, logistics, and retail. So I'll give one example in retail. So if, if you think about these examples in Nigeria, Nigeria has about 200 million people. And if you think about, like when I lived in, for example, in Connecticut, you know, stores like Stop and Shop, they would have had easily for a state like Connecticut, just the state, or even in some cases, certain cities within that, uh, the major stores would have had somewhere between five and 20 stores each. Now, that's in a state, right? With a, you know, a small population. Nigeria with 200 million people, I'd say five or six years ago, the largest grocery store had about 20 stores for the entire country. And so that's so the first point there is that's a domestic issue, which, which speaks to this whole diversification issue. Like that's completely disconnected from what's going on globally. In fact, it's not even a national issue. It's a localized issue. You're in a city, you just want to go down the street and get your groceries. It's that simple, right? And so in that sector, 
we saw an opportunity for greater retail penetration. And so we invested in a couple of companies there or companies that we've seen come. We invested and we've seen others invest in, in companies in that sector. And the dynamics there are very interesting. One, you've got cities with a huge population that before they had organized retail had to go stand in line at a market. When it rains, they got to put on gumboots to go to the market. They have to deal with traffic just to get groceries. Enter organized retail that can assure them of high quality goods at the price points they want, convenient, close to them. And what you see there is that consumers are willing to pay much higher than global margins for those products. That's one, in a way that's sustainable. Two, because the penetration is pretty low, but also from an impact perspective. If you think about how people's lifestyles change when you introduce organized retail into their lives, it's huge, right? So all of a sudden, like parents, can get home to their kids in time because they can get their groceries in time. They don't have to be stuck in traffic. For anyone who's been in Lagos, right? Traffic could be five hours, right? Literally, you could be stuck in traffic for five hours. So you can kind of cut all of that out simply because you've got uh, organized retail. So I think that's one example where you get, you get secular themes driving sectors, industries, and businesses to create potentially interesting returns in a way that is domestic and insulated from what's going on globally. It's not a global macro theme, which then is attractive from a diversification standpoint, but also where you can have very, very strong social impact at the same time. That's fascinating. And I think we'll end on that. Peter, Richard, I just want to thank you both so much for your time. Hey, Jim, thanks very much. I um, appreciate Bridgewater for having, having us on here. Appreciate the opportunity. Thanks so much, Jim. It was a real pleasure being on.